Welcome, welcome to the State of the City pre-show. My name is Eric Hanberg. I'm a commissioner on the Metro Parks Board of Tacoma, and I'm also the host of the Citizen Tacoma podcast. On the podcast, I get to interview elected and community leaders about what's happening in our community. It's a great place to nerd out about civic issues, and that's exactly what we're doing here tonight on the pre-show. We are previewing Mayor Victoria Woodard's State of the City conversation. Tonight's theme is Our Path Forward. The mayor will be discussing how our community is moving forward after a very difficult time. My guests tonight to preview that conversation are Carla Santerno, Superintendent of Tacoma Public Schools. Welcome, Carla. Thank you. And Eric Johnson, Executive Director at the Port of Tacoma. Welcome, Eric. Fellow Eric. <laughs> And it's always exciting to have uh, Mayor Victoria Woodard uh, here as well. Thank you for being here, Mayor. Thank you, Eric. And thank you for being here, both Eric Hamburg and the Park Commissioner this evening. <laughs> so uh, why don't we start by talking uh, about coming out of this pandemic. We have just had a crash course uh, in what the community really needs during a time of crisis. And I think we also saw where some of the holes are in our service. I'd like to hear from each of you about how the pandemic has shaped uh, how your organization is planning to move forward. What's forever changed? And uh, Carla, maybe we can start with you. That's great. I'll start. Uh, one of the things that's for, I'll start with what's forever changed, and that is we are a one on one. We, every single student in the Tacoma Public Schools has their own laptop, <laughs> and that is new. We had never planned on being a one on one district, but that changed. And we have teachers that have gone through incredible training to make sure that they know how to use these different learning platforms. We've had parents that have come in and learn how to help their students in a new way on a, you know, in a remote channel. Um, we've had uh, our teachers that have learned how to assist and how to do homework and things in a different way. And so that has, that will be a forever change for us. And we're kind of excited. Um, you'll laugh, one of the big discussions we've been having lately is that our students are scared to death that we'll never have another snow day. We'll just slip into remote. <laughs> they will have to do learning inside. So we're, we've, got, we've got discussions going on on both sides of that. Um, it definitely exposed gaps because we know in the city of Tacoma, we still have students that don't have reliable internet and uh, a reliable way to uh, you know, to stay connected to the internet when we've had teachers that have done home visits and sent out packets and lots of things. So we know we still have to work with that. Um, you know, we are systematized and the bottom line is we don't know when the vestiges of this pandemic are gonna be over. So, you know, we are still social distancing. We are still cleaning. We are still masking. We are still having uh, parents do attestations. We think that that'll change, you know, over time. But one of the things I'm confident about is that we are able to be flexible and to pivot back and forth. We will forever, we will forever, I believe, have a Tacoma Online Academy. We just registered it with the state this week, last week, I think, to be a permanent school. And so wow. last year we served 3,600 kids online. And we found out that there's a lot of students that really, really liked it and uh, some parents that really liked it. So far this year, we've got about 1,600 folks that have signed up. So we just wanna, uh, I wanna uh, reemphasize that if you wanna be on online learning, get signed up so that we can uh, get you and it starts with a waiting list but as soon as we get a big enough chunk of students in that waiting list that are ready to move to that uh, online platform uh, we quickly can re uh, you know recreate another class so those are all things that uh, we're looking forward to uh, the most important thing I want to say is that next year right now we're looking at full-time five days a week every day so I want to hear some parents doing a shout out out there uh, we're going to get your kids back and we want you if you left because you needed five days a week come on back come back we want you here we want your first grader here we want your kindergarten here we've got a summer program that is out of this world that'll get your students where they need to be so we're excited about that 
Well, as a, a parent of two kids at Tacoma Public Schools, <laughs> I appreciate all of the things that you've been having to do, and I appreciate the computers. And uh, it's been it's been uh, quite a thing, but I'm I'm uh, really proud of how the community got through that. And I am also looking forward to five days a week. I got to tell you. Amen. That. Amen. And thank thank you to all the parents and teachers and staff and everybody who pivoted and did things differently for I you know for yeah. over a year. Incredible. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Eric, what about you? What's changed at, at the port? Uh, what, what are you thinking about right now? Yeah, well, I'll start by saying, giving a shout out to, uh, to Carla and her colleagues and, and all the other school districts, frankly, in the county, who have done an extraordinary job in this process. Um, my job was easy compared to working for a school. I'll tell you that. Um, we had challenges, but we didn't have the challenges that the schools had. And I've got friends that are teachers and, and uh, I've been talking to them about it. And so I just want to tell you guys how much I personally am so impressed uh, and grateful for the job that you've done because educating from home like that is hard. It's hard. hard. And Thanks, uh, Eric. it's hard. So my job is my job is simple at a port. You know, we uh, we pivoted to remote work. Um, you know, in March of 2020, I guess it was, for everybody who could work from home. So um, everybody who can work from home has been working from home. And, but you, there's a lot of stuff at the port you can't do from home, right? You can't load a ship from home. You can't maintain equipment from uh, cranes from home. You can't do security patrols from home. So those workers are basically have been frontline workers and they have done an amazing job. We have not had any COVID out, significant COVID outbreaks in our waterfront, which is unlike some of the other ports on the West Coast. We've been very lucky. And that's a, that's a tribute to our local longshore union uh, and the work of our employees, they were, they have extraordinary protocols in place, equipment, cleaning, masks, everything. And uh, we have doubled down on our, on our protocols and it paid off. So going forward, you know, we're like a lot of other local governments in this regard. We're trying to figure out what our new hybrid workforce is going to look like. I don't think we're going to go back to five days a week uh, with everybody, you know, in an, in, a, in an office or a cubicle. But we're also, I don't think, going to go back to everybody being all the way at home all the time. People need to get together. Work gets done in hallways and in, in staff meetings and around a coffee pot. Um, there are things that happen with interactions between people that are positive. And I want to bring that back and, and get, that, um, get that in place. And the other thing that is, is true, in my opinion, is it's very hard to bring in new employees when everybody's working from home. Um, it's easy to have a Zoom meeting when everybody knows each other because we all know each other. But when you don't know anybody, it's hard to learn to meet people through a through a laptop screen. So you we we need personal interactions. Those have to happen. But going forward, we're going to be a changed organization, no question about it. And um, that's just yeah. that's just the way that's the way of the future. And we're Absolutely. being flexible. We haven't come to any conclusions about how that's going to look. I'm, I'm watching and listening to everybody else and we'll make some decisions. That makes a lot of sense. Mayor, what about at the city? <clears throat> well, you know, it's so funny. Um, I was thinking, Eric, as you were asking the question, I was thinking, well, what has changed? There's a, a lot has changed, but I was just thinking about why is it so different? I remember there was a time when I actually worked for Pierce County. I mean, so I've worked for local government before. And I remember, you know, saying, I want to telework was almost like a curse word. Like in government, you don't telework. I mean, could you imagine a teacher saying, I want to telework or someone from the court saying, I want to telework. It's like, no, come to the office. And, 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 and we pivoted. I mean, I, I'm sure we had some downtown, but within a week, I mean, we stood up local government in a pandemic and everybody was at home. Um, I mean, not everybody, obviously, our first responders and our frontline workers, our essential workers were, were, were out there. But, but I mean, we, we stood it up, our council meetings. We didn't miss a council meeting because of COVID. Um, we just, we just, we just, we shifted and we innovated all across the city. And so I think as we come back, I know one thing that's going to forever be different, there will never just be in-person council meetings, ever. Now, I mean, I shouldn't say, if the state law that, that they're adopting on the OPA, Open Public Meetings Act, if, if that changes the way that it should in this pandemic, we will never have just only in-person meetings because we found that in, um, in the Zoom platform, we have more people who have participated in local government than ever before. Why? Because you get to be at home at five o'clock. You can still feed your kids dinner or, or, or do the things you need to do around the house or, you know, um, or if you live further away from city hall or if you, you you don't have transportation right people can 
participate in local government and they don't have to physically get to this building to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think that to me is one of the biggest things that's, that, is, that has changed that will remain forever changed. The way we deliver services, I mean, obviously City Hall will open again and you'll be able to come into the 311 counter and come get a permit. But all the things that we've moved online, a lot of those things we're gonna keep online and we're gonna enhance them because we found that it's just easier to, to do business that way. But when Eric was talking, I was like, he's so right about, you know, training new employees. But I remember um, from our first show, Our Economy, we hired Katie Condon. I was chair of the board. We interviewed and hired Katie Condon last year. And I met her for the first time when we taped the State of the City address. And I didn't, I met her for the first time in person. I'd been in so many meetings with her. I didn't even realize it was the first time in person. Um, I just thought I'd been in so many meetings with her. I just assumed I knew her. But it is that dynamic of meeting people for the first time and getting to know them. And those things that only happen in person, I think, are still very important. But I think you're going to see people get hired who live in different places, um, who are now working for, for companies. Um, I mean, at City Hall, that might be a little bit different. But I think I think that the telework, the innovative Zoom, I think I talked about it last time from the Jetsons, um, the fact that we can do this now, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to forever change this. I don't know when's the next, when the next time will be that I get on the highway to go to a meeting in Seattle, but I can just sit right here in my office and do it. And I think that's what we're going to see a lot in government. And I would say that the pandemic and this innovative way that we're doing business, I think has probably had some of the greatest effects on local government. Yeah. So, so Eric, since you're, you know, we, we don't have a park, we, the park district isn't represented. Um, uh, well, it is represented by you today, but, but since Sean was unable to join us, Eric, for you, what shifted at the, at the parks, um, at Metro parks, what, what will forever be changed? What are the yeah. issues that you all have made? Certain, certainly some of the, the, the telework stuff that both, you know, we've heard from everyone. Um, you know, Metro Parks really saw a role uh, for itself in childcare during that time, um, which was something that was uh, not, um, you know, we did day camps and summer camps, but like early on, right there for first responders, um, childcare with a variety of other uh, nonprofits and other agencies supporting it. Um, but that's something where, you know, it's, it's, it's so clearly this, this huge community need and we're working to become more robust there and, and be more supportive of the community. It's one of those holes that um, uh, really needed some someone to really come in and help and help. You know, there's lots of providers out there, but we we were able to really step in during a time of crisis, and I think um, we'll continue to invest in that area. So yeah. I think that you'll that that's one of those good examples from from our side. There, you know, Mayor has talked about that there were two pandemics, in some ways there was. Uh, there was because there was also this this rise in understanding of of what systemic racism uh, has been doing in our our country, and we've known that this is an issue for generations. But 2020 marked a turning point, you know, we hope, in how our community expects it to be addressed. And I'm curious if we can go around again. What is being done uh, to transform your organization to address systemic racism in our community, and even within your own service delivery? Carla, why don't we start with you again? Sure. So, you know, eliminating racism and achieving equity is an important thing in education because we cannot give students a full education unless we are treating them equitably. And so that's something we've been working on. But it was interesting that right before the pandemic, we had sat down as a school community and said, you know, we're, we're still missing the boat. We have achieved, we are, we're achieving some equity in graduation and we're proud of that, but we still have achievement gaps that uh, prim primarily are looked at that culturally responsive teaching. So early in 2020, and actually it was right before the pandemic uh, started, we had uh, written, I had a design team that was writing a specific curriculum for equity for our teachers and staff. Because what we've determined is that it's systemic through the school district. You've got to make a system where everybody has the same vocabulary. They know the actions, they know the definitions, they know, um, they know what a microaggression is. They are able to you know, uh, be so culturally competent that our students are going to uh, recover. So what we've started is is, um, is, a, a, is, a, is three trainings, three modules where we want everybody to take it. Nutrition workers, bus drivers, custodians, anybody who works in Tacoma Public Schools, 
we want you to take that training and understand the best practices and how to be culturally responsive. And we want it systemic throughout our whole system. And of course, we're really, uh, our teachers are working so hard to learn all of those uh, techniques and strategies for totally honing in on what a child needs, regardless of their race or situation or religion or whatever, and to make sure they get the education they need. And that's how uh, a, 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 a uh, equitable, uh, uh, equitable environment will take place. In addition, you know, I'm retiring the superintendent in June of 30, and then I am going to take another year. And one of my primary duties is to really actualize the work that we're doing. And so I'll be able to work with partners and we're going to, you know, we're going to talk about the partnerships that we have, because I believe this community has a common desire to eliminate racism and to come up with best practices with cultural, you know, culturally responsive and relevant um, education. So I'll be looking forward Forward to working with um, our system and making it better and functional and also working with community partners. Thank you, Carla. And thank you for uh, your service to the district. Congratulations. Oh, absolutely. Best time of my life. <laughs> Eric, what's what's happening at the port in this area? Yeah, so, you know, um, in some ways, Carla has, has an easier job because education, the education system is one that's relatively well understood by most people in the community because we've all been to schools and it's a relatively accessible part of our world we you know it's a we all know how to get involved with our with our local school districts it's you know it's not a mystery the waterfront on the other hand is kind of just the opposite we are poorly understood by most people and it has traditionally been a very insulated place um that that's not just that's not unique to tacoma um Virtually every port uh, waterfront that I'm aware of in the United States and probably in the world is a relatively insular place. It's, it's a hard place to get into. Um, that's just a cultural thing. And so uh, we have a challenge here because we need to do two things at the same time. We need to make ourselves more accessible to the broader community. And we need to find a way to get an understanding within the waterfront of what systemic racism is and how we eliminate it. And um, I'm taking a very thoughtful approach to this because I do what I do not want is to, to just have a, a brief exercise where we take a class and say, there, we did it. Mm -hmm. um, I want to have a process where we really get into this issue and talk about it and get it discussed right in the sinews of the organization and have a thoughtful process of going forward. And I'm, I need some help in this space. This is not the area that I'm, I, this is not my area of expertise. Uh, we've stood up a, a, a staff, um, I'm sorry, a committee at the port of about a, I think about 14 people, but that includes two commissioners, by the way. So we have got two of our elected officials, uh, which is two of our five, we have five elected officials. And so 40% of our governing organization is on the committee Commissioner Dick Marzano and, and Kristen Ang are on the committee. So I've got, um, I'm having discussions that include my authorizing environment uh, in, this, in this space. And we need to bring in people who can help us think this through. Um, we have, we have ex some expertise within the port, frankly. We're not all white guys. There are people at the port who, are, who don't look like me, but uh, we've got room to improve. And we need to, I need to find a way to bring in folks who are, um, who are thoughtful in making changes to an organization that stick. Thank you. For uh, because like I said, my, what I'm very wary of is change, uh, uh, doing things that scratch a short-term itch, but don't deal with a long-term issue. Mm. Uh, and so I'm, I want to do this in a way that changes changes our waterfront, and um, that's going to take some time. Thank you. And by the way, preaching patience on an issue that is four hundred years old hmm. is a little bit difficult. Hmm. So I understand that saying, "Oh, just give me a little time." Yeah, right. Um, this issue is four hundred years old. So I'm I'm not one who's going to say we need patience because we need action. Um, and so 
that's the that's the challenge that we have down down in the tide flats, and um, it's very much on my mind. Uh, I think about it every day, and um, um, we're we're doing. I'm, I want to move at the at the fastest speed that we can while sustaining the change. Yeah, I appreciate that, Mayor. What about what's happening at the city with with along these lines? Oh goodness, I think you're going to hear some of it in in the upcoming show this evening. So I'll try not to. I'll try not to rehash um, what's been said, but just a couple things the city has done. You know, during COVID, um, during this, during these two pandemics, um, COVID and systemic racism, we passed the budget, um, and part of that budget, or that not part of that budget, but that budget included what we're calling race, racial equity action plans. Each department had to do a racial equity action plan to go along with the with their budget, and so um, that that was part of our internal work. Um, we also have stood up Heal the Heart, which is helping empower and lift um, for the city, which is an external group of community members who are going to help us look um, externally at all the barriers that need to be removed from systemic first to, to get to a city that is anti-racist. Um, we at the city passed resolution 40622 last June as a policy guide that said that we are going to work towards being an anti-racist city. And all of these things were born out of that. Now, I, 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 Eric said it so eloquently, right? Patience is not the question we have to ask, um, but because we've been here way too long. But what I will remind everybody is that while we've been here way too long, we're not gonna get out of here overnight. It's gonna take time. And as Eric said, we gotta be thoughtful um, and we've gotta be thorough. And I will tell you that while, our, while the first um, policy area that we're looking at will be, um, will be public safety. Um, it is not the only area that we're looking at. We saw a lot of people cry out for reform in policing this summer. But as I tell people, I'm not interested in making a perfect criminal justice system. We want to focus on removing barriers from every system um, that stops people from achieving their destiny, which is, which is who we are, the city of destiny. So we've got uh, racial equity plans internally. We've also, we also have an internal group that's looking at all of our internal policies um, to see where the barriers exist in those policies. Um, we already have an office of equity and human rights that we've had for several years, but we are, we are looking at how we can be better in that office. We've got externally heal the heart, um, we, we are now working with the National Network for Safe Communities who are going to come in and do some reconciliation work because we believe that our community needs to heal from the pains of the past and you'll be hearing more about that. But there's so much work that we're doing, doing. but let's be clear, as we all know, sitting around this table, there's so much work to be done. Um, we didn't get here overnight. We're not going to get out of this overnight. But I think that one of the things that COVID did is it showed us it clearly, if, if you were somehow denying that inequities existed before, if you didn't get it through COVID, I don't know when you will, because really COVID just exposed the true inequities that have been existing for a really long time. Um, and, and, and those inequities <laughs> in the uprising of citizens and community members last year telling us demanding change tells us that I believe we're in the next civil rights movement and we have an opportunity now to make the changes that weren't made in the 60s. And it's gonna be up to the leaders that are on this call to help us do that. So Eric, what are you all doing over at the Park District? Uh, at the Park District, equity is, is one of the core pillars of our strategic plan. And we've done, and that's you see that in bigger ways and small ways. But you know, one of the things that I was really excited by like over the winter, we had a team uh, that was dedicated to just doing um work in under invested communities so take the parks that are in places using actually the city's data on inequality in tacoma yep. um that map that, that you've published and using that to go to parks that that needed you know needed needed some help needed some extra attention and that was their entire focus in the off season so there's there's some big ways and then there's really focused ways like that that i think are uh really powerful if you're if that's your park if it's you know down the street uh, better playground, you know, fencing improved, whatever it is, um, to bring it up to par. So it, it's it's a mix, you know, you got to address the, the little things and you got and then you have to look at those big systemic changes as well uh, that, that can really take the time to to turn. Mayor, um, I want to give you the final word on our on our pre show. Uh, our theme tonight uh, for the state of the city this year is transforming our destiny together. 
and you have here, you know, four organizations represented, uh, four different governments. Um, how are how is everyone working together across uh, organizations, you know, between governments uh, to transform our destiny together? You know, Eric, what is so heartwarming is that I sit on the screen here with with our superintendent Carlos Santerno and our court director Eric Johnson. This is not the first time we've been on the Zoom screen together. Um, and, 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 and so we're not strangers to one another. And it's, it's not because we've just been in meetings where people called us together. It's because we've been in meetings where we called each other together. And I think, you know, throughout this series, and this is the last one tonight, um, this is the last installment of this four part series. What you've heard is that it's, it's, it's our destiny that, that we are doing it together and and what's i think that's the theme of tacoma you hear people talk about what makes tacoma so special it's the people well you know who runs all these systems it's these people and 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 it's because we have um such smart innovative and and i'm going to add caring people in our community who are leading organizations that's why we can transform our destiny together it takes all of us. It takes everyone who's leading any system or any business or any community-based organization. It takes every community member um, to move this city forward and to make the changes that we that need to be made so that equity isn't just a goal, it's our reality. Um, and so I, I, I think that that being here today is is one way but this let's be clear to community we didn't just throw this show together and all show up and have this conversation this was just a preview of the conversations we have every single day whether it's at a policy level or whether it's at an administrative level um we are always talking and working together with the port you know we're working together on um on the sub area plan um, deciding what the future of our port will be together, um, what we want it to look like. And it's not being done to the port, it's being done with the port. So we are teammates in this work. And when I think about um, Tacoma Public Schools and Carla, we are forever working together. They stood up childcare for our first responders. Um, and, and we have worked in tandem with them to either help supply additional supports to them during this time, um, we've just been partners all along. So none of this is new, but it's so incredibly, um, it's, it's such an honor to be able to highlight to community how we work together. And um, I do want to take just a moment, since this may be the first public time, uh, the last public time I'm with our superintendent, but I do just want to take a moment and Carla, just publicly thank you. I'm sure I'll do it a number of times for all of your work in this community and for being the kind of leader who gets collaboration. We work together on Summer Jobs 253, on getting our kids um, employed over the summer. That did not stop in COVID. We pivoted and, and, and we even had more kids engaged in Summer Jobs 253 where it actually got credit as well. So see two specific programs I can talk about how we're working together. Um, and then I can't even begin to talk about Metro Parks. I mean, we manage property together. We manage community centers together. We work to open warming centers over, over the winter with Metro Parks. So it is this, they were, you all provided the building, we provided the service provider. And, and so there are all kinds of ways that our government is working together. I look forward to more, more of that, but it, it, is, it really is true that together um, we are transforming our destiny. So um, it's why I picked the theme. It's why we're all here today. And I thank all of you, Eric, thank you so much for doing this um, for Tacoma, not for the city or for me, but for, for the residents of Tacoma for hosting these conversations. Appreciate you, appreciate everyone. Looking forward um, to, to winding up um, this year's State of the City Address. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. you. Uh, that is going to bring our show to a close. And I want to thank all of my guests for joining me, Carla, Eric, Mayor Woodards. It's been a real pleasure. Yes. Thank Let's you so much for the invitation. I appreciate it. It's been, it's been a huge pleasure. And like the mayor said, we talk to each other all the time. Uh, <laughs> yep. This is you know, part, too, so, too many I, partnerships to even share. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> right. Right. If, we, if I started, I'd be here till noon. So <laughs> I just say there's thank a lot you, of everyone. good things going on and uh, we're going to keep doing them. Thank you. We're going to get on with uh, the state of the city conversation.
pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States y la república for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for, for all. all. It is my pleasure to host this State of the City conversation on Our Path Forward. We're gonna have a discussion on how the city and the utilities have adapted to serve our residents and staff, the many learnings of this historic year, and our hopes for a very bright future. But before we get started with that discussion, I wanted to take a, take a moment to call out some very special leaders that I get to work alongside of every single day. We've been together for quite some time, and we've done a lot of work over this unprecedented year. But I want to be clear, we do this work together. And if we're gonna transform the destiny of our city, we must work together. I'm so grateful to work alongside the Tacoma City Council and all of its members. I'd now like to take a moment to talk about the great work of my colleagues on the City Council. I'd like to start by recognizing Deputy Mayor Keith Walker for his leadership on Resolution 40685 to establish data collection practices at the Tacoma Police Department. Council Member Hines for his role in the successful opening of the temporary emergency micro shelter site in his district and engaging his neighbors to answer all questions regarding the tiny home site. I'd like to thank Council Member McCarthy as he continues to lead approaches to addressing opioids and securing funding for a local summit in 2021 and for his laser-like focus on public safety in our city. Councilmember Ushka has focused her leadership in equity and transformation on housing and in the last budget cycle championed a disparity study to look at home ownership in our community. And she is also forwarding Tacoma's work with the National League of Cities Eviction Prevention Learning Lab. Councilmember Walker has been a strong policy lead on the city's anchors initiative, including her work with these partners on the National League of Cities of Opportunity initiative to holistically address job creation and economic growth. Over the recent years, my colleagues and I have deeply enjoyed working with three other people who will be finishing their terms on the city council at the end of this year. Council members Chris Beale, Lillian Hunter, and Robert Toms. Councilmember Beal has had bold leadership on Vision Zero, driving the city's commitment to eliminate all traffic fatalities and severe injuries while increasing safe, healthy, and equitable mobility for all. Councilmember Hunter has been focused on initiating our age-friendly cities designation and the creation of a work group to identify and enhance programs that benefit the city's elders since they are an incredible asset to our community. And Councilmember Toms has really focused his work on economic development with our state and local partners to support our small businesses and restaurants in innovative ways during COVID and beyond. He's been responsible for leading efforts like takeout drinks, minimizing fees for delivery services, and the expansion of sidewalk cafes and other dining options. I am so grateful that I get to work alongside such a talented and committed group of council members who are striving to make Tacoma a better place for everyone. I'm also thankful to them for standing alongside me as we passed resolution 40622, which was our commitment to making Tacoma an anti-racist city. We know that there are a lot of systems that have to be transformed, but that resolution called for us to do it by acknowledging the city of Tacoma's existing systems and recognizing that they have not adequately served the needs of everyone in our community. By expressing our commitment and following through on community-led multi-sector transformation. By directing the city manager to develop the city's first anti-racist budget. 
by prioritizing anti-racism in the evaluation of new policies and programs, as well as a sustained and comprehensive transformation of existing services, with the initial priority being given to policing and for working so hard to build a legislative platform at the local, state, and federal level that transforms institutions impacted by systemic racism for greater equity and well-being of all residents in Tacoma, Washington State, and the United States of America. Our city could not operate without the best contributions of each one of my peers on the city council. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce my guests for a conversation on our path forward. I'm delighted to be joined today by Elizabeth Pauley, our city manager, and Jackie Flowers, our Tacoma Public Utilities Director. Ladies, thank you so much for being here today. You know, in countless ways, this last year has been challenging. Almost every service that the city offers, I mean, I don't know about almost, I would think every service that the city offers has had to adapt over this last year. As we embrace systems transformation to become an anti-racist Tacoma, we will need to continue to courageously innovate and change the way we do business as we did in this past year. But no matter what the challenges we faced in the year behind us and those that await us in the year ahead, I am so grateful to have these two key leaders at the helm as we navigate history together. As mentioned, the city and the Coma Public Utilities have experienced massive shifts into how we do business, how we serve our community members and our customers. I know that we've had to significantly and very quickly ramp up our online presence and capabilities. So just curious, how do you all think it's gone so far? Elizabeth? So Mayor, I would start with just how proud and grateful I am of all of our employees. Yeah. Starting with our first responders and our field crews that are out there exposed doing yeah. their job. Yeah. And I'm um, just so grateful for them for continuing their great service to the community as well as our employees that did transition to a virtual environment and making adjustments to having children at home while they were doing that and having daycare issues. And each one of our employees in all of those different situations has so, shown so much dedication to the work they do, to our community and to each other. And I think it's gone amazingly well, but it's because of our employees. I, I, I would not argue with you at all. I will say this, one of the things that has been really nice is getting on Zoom meetings with our employees and we get to see new babies and children who have grown up. So that part's been <laughs> really fun. Jackie, how's, how's it been for TPU? Oh, same, Mayor. I just agree with City Manager's assessment. Just really proud of the organization, incredibly in awe of how adaptable the employees yeah. have been and how resilient our operations have been. It's as if they didn't miss a beat, even though we know that period of time when we transitioned and made adjustments to you know how the field staff was doing their work mm -hmm. that was a transition to continue to enhance the security and protective measures for for those employees and then likewise the employees that were transitioned to remote work had a couple weeks where it probably felt like they lost their equilibrium but they bounced right back and we also uh, transitioned to a complete virtual customer service agents so it was mm -hmm. something that we piloted before and uh, you know, quickly and abruptly implemented those changes, probably breaking all change management protocols. But it was really important for us to, you know, again, limit the number of people that were coming into the building so those continuity staff would continue to be protected, and then also to minimize any exposure customers may have. So we really ramped up that virtual support element, and, and that was an area that they, they adapted very well. Well, speaking of adaption, you know, so often they say government is the slowest to adapt, right? We, I mean, I remember thinking about um, when we would talk about telecommuting, it was like government doesn't telecommute. We show up at the office every day. So we think about things like how quickly we shifted to telecommuting and virtual meetings and, you know, how it seemed like we didn't miss a beat. Um, talk a little bit, what surprised you about um, the dramatic operational shifts that we've made um, and that we're making as an organization in the midst of this tremendous change? Elizabeth? Well, on the one hand, I, I hate to say it's a surprise because I do have such confidence in our employees. Yeah. At the same time, um, I do want to share, Mayor, that we were able to maintain service levels and in many ca cases increase them 
during this time, even as we were transitioning to this new environment. And we also either started or expanded some really, really critical programs. So Jackie mentioned her customer service team and our 311 team, for example, was able to decrease their drop, dropped call rate and, and continue again, continue and enhance the services that our community is receiving. And, and that was really a welcome surprise. What about you, Jackie? What surprised you? I, I will say, um, <laughs> I guess maybe it was a bit of a surprise, but we found out how adaptive we really are. Yeah. And to the point of, you know, maybe we get criticized for being slow to transition or transform. We found out that we've got muscle there that we can continue to build off of into the future. And um, I was also equally as impressed with the amount of work and effort that was completed, the projects that were completed, just it exceeded my expectations given how much uncertainty there was and trans transition there was um, in the day-to-day -day work protocols. But also there was innovation happening, right? At every level, um, employees were finding ways to do their job better, finding technology to help enable them to do their job better, to enhance our services to customers. And uh, one of the best examples I think for 2020 from my perspective was really how quickly our team pivoted to make emergency assistance funding available mm -hmm. for our customers who were early on impacted by the pandemic and um, that transition of those dollars that we had for utility assistance. We were one of the first, if not the first in the country, to offer assistance to our customers and was just really proud of the team for leaning into that and you know, recognizing that you know, our customer base needed hand and they were there to, to lend a hand. And I think one thing that I really appreciate, and I, uh, we, we were having a conversation earlier on economy, is the fact that we didn't just provide that service for our residents, for our residential customers. We also provided that support for our business customers as well. Is that, is that correct? We supported them as well. Absolutely. And the collaboration with you know the general government team and helping to get those CARES dollars to small businesses in our community. We had another big rally at the end of the year working collaboratively with general government. And I think Think, you know, not only did we see adaptability and innovation, but we saw a tremendous amount of collaboration across the entire organization, and it served us well. Well, you know what they say, crisis is the mother of, of, of invention, and I would almost say innovation, because it really has caused us to look at how we can do things differently. But we talked about the pandemic that is COVID, but this has also been another tough year because I believe we've had two pandemics, and that other pandemic being systemic racism. And, and again, grateful for your leadership and support as the council passed resolution 40622 to become an anti-racist city. But tell me, what are the two of you, what are, what are we working on administratively about how we make not just, I mean, we're focused on the outside of City Hall, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done inside City Hall, um, both in, at, at general government and at TPU. So Elizabeth, tell us a little bit about what you're focused on. Thank you, Mayor. You know, we have so many efforts underway and some of the core pieces of those, those efforts include what we're calling REAPs, which are racial equity action plans. Each department and each division, in the case of um, Tacoma Public Utilities, is developing a racial, a racial equity action plan. And what those plans do is at a really um, discrete level for the business unit, look at how they can do their work through an equity lens and improve the services that we provide to communities that have been marginalized and perhaps have not received equitable service from the city. And so we're really looking forward to how those plans are going to influence what we do at the city. And, and Mayor, you also know that we've got um, efforts underway in terms of transforming our police department and the way it does business. And right now we're focused on implementation of the recommendations that we got through 21 uh, first century, 21st century <laughs> policing. And they've shared 64 recommendations with, with us. And some of those are already in progress. Other of those will tie in with our community efforts as we hear more from our community about how we are reimagining public safety. But those are just some of the ways that we're working hard um, in the area of um, systems transformation. And what's happening at TPU? Well, Mayor, we are absolutely 100% involved and supportive of the work that's happening with general government and working together collaboratively with the anti-racist transformation framework that's being put together. We appreciate the opportunity to be partnering with the, the city, the general government in that, in that element. And, you know, it's interesting when I think back pre-pandemic, just a little before the pandemic, we had um, the Public Utility Board had adopted a strategic directive around equity and inclusion. And it was one of our first, it was our first strategic directive, but it was one of our first priorities related to, you know, DEI work. And 
And then we also stood up an equity committee who, through last year, led us through an organizational assessment of our racial equity did kind of a deep dive gap analysis of all of our programs and services, both inward facing and outward. And that information we were able to use to develop our racial equity action plan that um, Elizabeth talked about earlier. And of course, we're actively engaged in that. We've also expanded the city's equity index to include all of the Tacoma Water and Tacoma Power Service territories. So we're gonna be able to really provide a thorough analysis of the equity of our services to our entire customer base. We're excited to be rolling that out this year. So. Um, a lot of great work, foundational work, but a lot of work still to do. Absolutely, but I, you know, before you can really move forward with the work, you've got to lay a firm foundation. And I think your leadership in the way that we're talking about this, both at the, both in general government at TPU, and it's coming from the top, right? You all are committed to doing this work. And I would say we're fortunate at the city of Tacoma that we we have incredible employees, and I couldn't I couldn't agree with you more. Um, but it's so great to see that our employees have the same desire to do this kind of work, but it, it starts with the two of you. So seeing your commitment, hearing your commitment and not just your words, but the actions that you're taking um, is so incredibly hopeful. I think for me, I'm lucky I get to work with you every day, but just for this entire community. And so, you know, as we talk about anti-racism and Elizabeth, you touched on this just a little bit, um, you know, policing being the thing that we're focused on on most. And as we look at the cases of, of Benny Branch and Manuel Ellis and others in our community, um, our community has called on us because mm -hmm. of those cases and because of what's happened nationally to really prioritize policing. And so what do you think is kind of the most important um, for community members to know about what we're doing and how we're doing this work and where can they get information? Sure, Mayor, I really think the most important thing for the community to know is that we're listening to yeah. community. And we um, intend for our efforts to be led by community, to have community tell us um, what community safety is, what it should look like, and the role of policing within that. So some of the things that we've done already reflect that. Eight Can't Wait, for example, yeah. implementation of those policies, implementation of body cameras, and including community members on our, on our bargaining team reflect that we've been listening. These are some of the ideas that came from community. And some of the things that we look for and expect and welcome um, are some of the things that might come forward from the Heal the Heart effort and from some of the legislative changes that have happened in regard to oversight of our police department. So we have listened, we're going to continue to listen, and we're gonna come out of this stronger, Mayor. I, I absolutely believe that. So we've talked about kind of where we've been and, and what we're doing, but you know, let's, let's look to the future because that's what this is all about. The state of our city is good, um, and, it's, I mean, and it's good even in the time of the pandemic, but there are great things to look forward to um, in the future. So as we, as we think about the innovations that we've learned over this year, and we think about how we, how we implement those innovations and move forward to be um, stronger, um, talk a little bit about how, what, what, what these innovations mean to you and what we've learned and how, how is it gonna improve? What have we learned and how's it gonna improve the way we do business moving forward? Elizabeth? So Mayor, one thing I think for sure is we're going to stay in some uh, element of the virtual world, yeah. both internally for the work we do and with our public meetings. One of our learnings was how um, that forum made uh, our public meetings more accessible to maybe the single mom cooking dinner could still listen to her council members talk about important issues. And for our employees, it's also um, allowed for some important work-like balance, as well as for us to um, reduce our commute, um, commute trip and the emissions relating to uh, commuting. So I think as we go forward, we're going to be retaining um, some of those elements. I think we'll have some hybrid versions of Absolutely. some meetings, but we'll retain that because of the accessibility. Um, I also think, Mayor, that some of the things we've done to be able to target our resources to the part, uh, portions of the community that need it most, mm. those are going to, um, we're going to hold on to those and we're going to increase the use of those and continue to innovate in that area so that the dollars we spend, the resources we use, have the most impact in the community. Well, I know I'm looking forward to, I remember, I remember before at a council meeting when someone wanted to call in and it was like, nope, you have to be here in person. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the ability, you're so right, the ability to call in, we've seen an uptick, not just in, not just in the number of people who testify, but who testifies, mm -hmm. because normally you got to see the same people 
you know, every month, but now you're seeing new people and coming out and testifying and sharing their thoughts in ways that weren't available before. So I, I'm grateful that we're going to stick with some of that. You know, as we look at as we look at TPU, and you all have have done a lot in this short period of time for innovation. Jackie, what do you what do you what do you take forward, and what gives you hope about how we do this work differently coming out of the pandemic? Well, as I think about again, I mentioned you know that now that we know how adaptable we are, yeah. I'm, I'm really hopeful that we'll continue to, you know, build off of those lessons learned from the pandemic and flex that adaptability muscle um, because I do believe it's critical to helping us continue to innovate and become better providers of service. You know, over the past year, we've deployed technology that has enabled us to um, in increase our operational efficiency and enhance our customer service, but we're just beginning. Yeah. We've got a lot of um, efforts going on. We're making technology investments that we think are gonna be the catalyst to our modernization efforts as we continue to redefine our customer experience and really get into touch and actively engage with what our customers desire, their values, their needs, their wants, and really bring value to the community and to the customers beyond what the traditional customer service has been into a more enhanced customer experience. And that's really where we're looking to leverage the technology and the innovation from the pandemic moving forward. Well, you know, as you say that, I just think about, um, I, I love calling our residents our customers, right? I, I mean, because those are the people that we wake up to serve every single day and i know that that our employees are committed to that service but i just i love because they are our customers they are the reason that we do business so speaking of our customers um you know um the america rescue plan passed and although we missed although we weren't included in funding um the first time around in the cares act we are going to get direct funding through the america rescue plan and so what 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 and, and 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 then we have the possibility of an infrastructure plan and that's got to be pretty exciting to a city that was facing deficits in both tpu and general government um how are we going to implement that and and i know the council's working very closely elizabeth with you and and jackie your board is with you how how do you see us implementing that and, and the impact it can have on our community so I think a couple things, Mayor, and you mentioned one of them. We're working closely with councils so that we know that as we um, pick where to focus these dollars that they'll be reflecting the community priorities. And so we are looking at, with the council, where we can have the most impact. And there's a couple ways we're looking at that. First of all, we're trying hard not to spread ourselves too thin <laughs> yes. to look for where, where we, there might be gaps that we could fill or where we might be able to enhance dollars used by maybe the county or the state to really maximize the, effort, um, the impact for our city of Tacoma residents and within the, pr the um, priority areas that they've identified through um, Vision 2020, 2025 and through the council's work. So, so we look forward to doing that and having more discussions about that as we learn a little bit more about how the, how the rules, what the rules are for applying these dollars. Yeah. And we also know, Mayor, that we are going to look at equity impacts as we um, make our decisions with these dollars. And we've got the tools and, and, um, and the full support of the council in, in doing that and focusing these dollars on the individuals and the groups within the community where, again, we can have the biggest impacts on their opportunities, on their health. And so again, at the end of this, our community is gonna come out stronger. And that's and at the end of the day, that's why the city exists, right? We exist to support our community. Jackie? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. And we do call them customers, and yes, they are our residents. They're our owners, right, yep. as well. Yep. And so it, it is an important relationship for us. Um, as we've gone through the pandemic, of course, going into the pandemic, we do periodic customer sur satisfaction surveys and assess customer needs. And we've been monitoring these trends, which have led to our, our digital transformation um, roadmap. Um, for the utility pre-pandemic. And of course, as we've moved into the pandemic, we've also done some additional surveys of, of customers to really understand how we're serving them through the pandemic and what they're gonna need on the post-pandemic recovery side of things. And so for us, one of the top priorities when we think about the funding opportunities is supporting our customers as they pursue assistance to recover their bills. Um, this is top priority for us right now. We know that we have customers that have delinquent accounts. We know that there's dollars that are available. We're coordinating closely with the city. We're coordinating closely with um, our other cities. We're coordinating closely with the community partners that are really the ones who provide a service and helping our customers connect with those and making sure they're aware of the opportunities uh, for assistance. And that's gonna be a focus, a strong focus of us for the remainder of the pandemic period and coming out of the pandemic to really try to help support them. 
Beyond that, we're excited about infrastructure um, because, of course, the administration has a strong focus on clean energy and decarbonization, and we're just uniquely positioned with our um, abundant clean energy sources to really lean in and help the city meet its goals for decarbonization, and we're really excited about those opportunities. We're also excited to continue to apply and grow the muscle of applying an equity lens to our services and our programs. Um, looking at things differently, so whether it's how we've done conservation, how we're um, making electric vehicles available or infrastructure, applying that equity lens and working you know, with the city to identify priority areas as we make investments and bring programs um, forward. And then of course, you know, always going to be at the center is maintaining our infrastructure, investing in our infrastructure, building that resiliency. What we've seen, you know, for a pandemic was a little different response than we always talk about the earthquake, right? So we want to just make sure that we're, we're doing what we can to continue to grow our emergency response capabilities, our security capabilities, and provide safe services to all of our customers, clean water and clean power. Well, that, this dovetails great with the conversation, you know, with one of our other, earlier conversations as we talked about our community and the environment and, and, and really how we get our entire community to understand the importance of, 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 of saving our environment and taking care, I should say taking care of our environment because it's so important as we, you know, a beautiful day in Tacoma, um, it is, but it, it, if we want it to continue to be that way, we've got to start, we've got to continue to take the kind of actions that you just laid out for us. Um, we just talked a little bit about infrastructure, mm -hmm. right? And so we've got ARP, there's a potential infrastructure package coming, which is completely different. Mm -hmm. what, how could Tacoma benefit from an infrastructure package? So the infrastructure package, I think, is really exciting and again puts us in another really historic um, situation where we have an opportunity to deal with aging infrastructure. Yeah. We have an um, opportunity to deal with equity um, issues relating to infrastructure such as broadband access. Um, some of those things that have really been become clear during the pandemic that we need to focus on but they take a lot of dollars so having this kind of stimulus is an amazing amazing opportunity. Um, it also will potentially have a big influence on jobs which is yeah. going to be really important to our community and on care of our elderly and our disabled. There's just so many aspects to the infrastructure plan that I think again give us a, a historic opportunity to really make some changes that I think again can be really foundational for this transformed community that we're looking forward to. Well, and that's, you know, that's kind of the excitement. We have ARP, we have infra potential infrastructure money, who knows what, you know, there, there's money that's gonna flow through the states, through the county. That's why I think the ongoing conversation about how we spend these dollars and how we focus this, these dollars are really important because we certainly don't wanna get too far out ahead of this additional funding that's, that's coming in so that we can make sure that we are targeting our dollars. Um, with, where they are needed the most and where they can do the most good. And I would add to where we can leverage the most partnership um, through this work. So as we close um, and we look ahead to the 2021-2022 biennium, and I've asked this, and we, as we recover from COVID, because we will, there will be a day when COVID will be in our rear view mirror. Um, but what gives you hope? What, as you wake up every day and, and and I know that there's COVID fatigue and, and it's been a tough year, unprecedented as we said many times. What gives you hope? What helps you get out of bed in the morning to say, I'm gonna do this again for another day? So Mayor, I'm actually gonna start with what um, I think the dual pandemics that you mentioned have exposed for us. So really the inequities in our community have been exposed in an unprecedented way. Yeah. And why is that connected to hope, you might ask. Um, so be because this has put an unprecedented focus really on um, social justice and on public health, I think a couple things have happened that give me hope. So where there was doubt about whether or not we had a, pro a problem, there is certainty <laughs> now. It's true. And for those of us that were already certain I think these dual pandemics have led to um, increased engagement and increased action. And so those are hopeful things to me. And, and, I, and I look forward to the changes that are coming. Jackie? Well, I'm happy to talk about the hopefulness and the recovery post-COVID. I think we're all ready, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, we're all excited to be getting vaccinated and you know, moving on. Um, I will just say after more than a year of workplace disruptions, 
in many areas, um, we have a really unique opportunity to reset the culture of our organization, mm. to bring forward out of the pandemic the things that, that suit us, and to leave behind those elements of culture that maybe don't anymore. Like, let's, as Elizabeth said, we, we know where our vulnerabilities are, we know where our um, discrepancies and inequities are. You know, let's, let's reconstruct the framework mm. that really works to bring forward what, what meets our needs and meets the desires of the community. And I think that that's an exciting opportunity. It's not very often that you get to think about what is it that we're doing? Why do we do it? And you know, how do we do this better? Um, so building off the lessons learned from the past year and really thinking about how to, how to grow in that adaptability, that transformation work, that's a great foundation for us to reset our culture and our service lens. Um, I'm really optimistic about those opportunities for us. Well, I can tell you, um, I'm optimistic and have great hope because we have the two of you leading us, not just through this pandemic, but out of this pandemic. And, and, and I'm so grateful for the way that you show up and the care that you, serve, that you show, not only to our community, but to our employees who work hard for us every single day. I am so grateful that the two of you joined me in this conversation as we talk about our path forward because there is a path forward. We will be moving ahead, make no mistake about that. Whenever I talk about transformation, I can't help but think of this beautiful gift that was given to me by Trinity Presbyterian Church. I was attending an event there when my car window got smashed and my car was broken into. A couple of weeks later, this arrived in the mail for me with a very beautiful heartfelt card. And when I looked at this, I thought, this is a difference between reform and transform. Because you see, in a reform situation, these little pieces of broken glass on the outside that represent my window, they would have tried to take those and put them back into the frame and try to make a window out of it again. But instead of trying to fit it into something old, they transformed it. They took these beautiful broken pieces, put it together with this beautiful heart, and it became a transformed beautiful piece of art. And that's the difference. That's what we're gonna do in Tacoma. We're gonna take all of the broken pieces, bring them together and transform, take all of the good and transform this city into a city that is as beautiful and as loving and as caring as this piece of artwork. Because you see, the reality is, is that glass is a prism. It reflects light back to us. It reflects who we are as people. And it influences how we see the world. Everyone has a different worldview, but we all need to come together in collaboration to bring our individual perspectives and create solutions together that wouldn't otherwise exist. Every issue requires us to think about and seek out another person's perspective. It reminds us that public policy alone can't change everything and that we must be able to join together as a region to do this work. But we know this and we are all capable of doing this. You ask me how I know? Because we are compassionate Tacoma and we will transform our destiny together.